Welcome everybody to our uh, conversation with Mark Blythe, who is a professor in international political economy at Brown. And Mark is the author of a new book, Angrynomics, which looks at why so many people today are angry and more importantly, what we can do about it. So Mark, welcome. And perhaps you can kick us off just by talking about where you're from, a bit about your background uh, and how you came to uh, look at some of these issues. Sure. Um, thanks for having me on uh, the program. It's great to have this opportunity. So I'm from Dundee, northeast coast of Scotland. When I first moved to the United States, people said, what's Dundee like? I used to say, it's the Flint, Michigan of Scotland. And they said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, when there's a boom, we have 13% unemployment. And when there's a slump, we have 14% unemployment. A lot of those people were angry. A lot of those people have been angry at politics and the way the economy works for a very long time. So in a sense, I was primed to see this going forward. So I moved out of Dundee and I went to Strathclyde for my undergraduate and then I went to Columbia for my graduate degree and then I taught at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore for 10 years and now I'm at Brown. So that's kind of like the, the quick tour of the personal history. And Angrynomics is a book that really looks at the, um, the reason why so many people across uh, democracies are feeling so uh, angry and disconnected uh, at this point, and as we're speaking, you know, we've got protests and riots taking place across the United States and across the United Kingdom here, where we've had a number of statues pulled down, and you know, anger is very much the theme uh, right. as 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 we talk. So, you know, just just tell us about the sort of central thesis of the book here, because unlike quite a few people, you're essentially saying that a lot of people have a lot of good reasons to feel angry. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So part of this is tied up in the stuff that we know about inequality, right? So the top 1% in the United States owns 24%, if not 28% of all national wealth. The bottom 60% have as much as the top 10%, etc., etc. et cetera. Those statistics kind of tell you something, but they don't tell you very much because there are high inequality countries that don't get angry, right? There are rich areas that uh, tend to vote uh, right populist if that's sort of the, the beacon of discontent in some way. So it's not simply sort of, you know, the economy makes you angry. So, so what are we saying? We try and put this into a big historical context. This is not an academic work. This is a, a dialogue between two people, almost like two guys in the pub, uh, trying to figure out what's going on. And what we do is we try and put this in a historical context. The middle of the book talks about macro -anchronomics. And what we point out is that capitalism is a bit like a computer. Right? It's got hardware and it's got software. Everybody has a labor market. Everybody has a capital market. Everybody has um, some kind of intermediation from banks to households, right? Plumbing, if you will. But the German labor market's really different from the American labor market, right? The British one's very different from the Russian one, whatever you like. So there's different hardware configurations. And the software, if you will, is basically the economic ideas we use to run these machines. Well, what happens is after a while, there are incompatibilities that build up between the hardware and the software and the system crashes. And when the system crashes, that produces an awful lot of pissed off users, just as it does in the computer world. So we took that analogy and worked with it and basically said, you know, if you think about the recent past, and we mapped this from the 1800s forward, but just the recent past, think about the following. You go to Mexico in 1994, big financial crisis, costs the US taxpayer 40 billion to bail out. Then there's the East Asian financial crisis, 140 billion. Then there's Russia, it's about 100 billion. Uh, then we stagger through until 2008, which is 13 trillion in lost income that disproportionately hits people who have less security and less assets, etc. And now we've got the COVID crisis, as we see in the lockdown protests, where people love to quote the statistic that you know most um, a majority of Americans would have four would have difficulty raising $400 in an emergency. Well, guess what? The emergency started three months ago, right? And this economy doesn't have big airbags like a Danish welfare state or something like this. So when the economy continues to slump like that, if there was some sense of equity in the way that the, the pain is meted out, that would be one thing. But if we think back to austerity Britain, what happens is places up north like Preston lose a third of their budget, which they're already massively reliant on government spending. London is hardly touched. The people who were doing well during those crises got all of their assets bailed out. We're seeing exactly the same thing now. So when you see a world in which the payoffs are asymmetric, the ones who already have everything and the ones who are insured, uh, 
the ones who already are being asked to adjust the most and risk the most are the ones who are the least insured, then yeah, guess what? They're going to get rather annoyed about that. And in, in the book, one thing you talk about is this distinction between sort of primitive tribal anger on one side and then this notion of moral outrage, this idea that essentially you've got a lot of people with some legitimate reasons, as you've just explained, to feel angry. And in a way, you're you're sort of blaming elites, media and politicians for whipping up the primitive anger while failing to address the moral uh, outrage. And just tell us a bit about, about what you mean by that and perhaps some examples of where we failed to adequately address that, that moral uh, indignation. Sure. Well, one of the examples we use in the book is Iceland. So if you cast your mind back to 2008, 2009, Iceland was a giant leverage party for bankers and hedge funds that went horribly wrong. And their central bank couldn't even bail them out because the banks were indebted to a thousand percent of GDP. It was a total disaster. People were angry, but they basically kept it together. They put up capital controls. The pain was meted out evenly. Banks actually went bust. Some people even went to jail, right? That's not what made them angry. What made them angry was 2016-17 when the Panama Papers came out. And it turned out that the people in charge had been sequestering all their money offshore and not paying any taxes while telling everyone else to tighten their belt and we're all in this together. And that's the type of moment where you see intense anger. Anger is moral outrage, a demand to be heard. Something you hear in populist protests of the left and the right systematically across countries is this notion that we are being ignored by our elites. And you know what? It's true because political science research from Marty Gillen onwards have actually shown that this is the case. That basically politicians legislate for the preferences of the top 20% of the income distribution. And the only time everyone else gets anything is if basically those preferences happen to align, which most of the time they don't. So moral outrage is this demand to be heard. Now another side of anger, when it's not weaponized, is norm regulation. So if you've ever been near a British football match, you'll understand this one. If you're in the stands of the hardcore fans, they're more likely to shout at you than anyone else. Because what they're saying is, you're not hard enough, you're not trying hard enough, you're not on the team, right? So basically, in moments of crisis, when you feel under threat, and this gets to micro economics, which we talk about as well, then in those moments of profound uncertainty, you look to those who are in similar situations as you. And then what we do is we tell stories to each other, think football matches, right, about we're on one side versus the other side. Now, when politicians grab a hold of this, and Trump is the perfect example of this, I think Brexit's far more complex, but Trump's the perfect example. He found a constituency like that, under stress, uncertain, ignored, demanding to be heard in the Midwest. The Democrats completely ignored that that was going on. He walked in and weaponized it. And he was also able to pivot seamlessly from that, then go with the southern states and talk about the border crisis and the Mexicans. So he was taking the fears of those communities and weaponizing them. But he was able to do that because anger functions in a sense as this protective mechanism, a norm regulator, as well as this demand to be heard. And what we do in the setup to the book is talk about these different types of anger and how we see them playing out in our politics. I mean, one of the arguments that's quite fashionable today is that uh, to David Goodhart, who's a British thinker here, who I've, I've talked with previously and David and I both made the same argument that it's often easier for the right to move left on economics than it is for the left to move right on culture. And Trump really grasped that fact, albeit irresponsibly, that he could talk to both economic protection and cultural protection. So that sort of raises the obvious question, which is if you're going up against Trump again, and we're obviously you know, approaching the US election quite rapidly, what do democrats need to do to try and push back on both of those fronts i mean your what's the message essentially of your book for biden have a message that would be a good start right um i think that the politics works out in a slightly different way i'd look at it this way i'd look at it more as a kind of plutocratic contest in terms of which collection of funders and billionaires get their preferences so if we think about again what happened in the democratic primary It's absolutely correct that on a grassroots level, Biden's campaign was saved by African-American voters the minute the campaigns moved south. And that that, um, uh, uh, Bernie's campaign essentially ran out of juice once it ran out of the kind of elite liberal northeast type states, right? It's absolutely true. But on the other hand, had Bernie continued, had he picked up the nomination, had he taken uh, Warren as a running mate, 
then all of the funding that makes fighting American politics possible from the sort of the millionaire and billionaire class that's on the democratic side, the Eric Schmitz of Google, Apple, people like this, and Wall Street in half, that would have evaporated because the one thing that they fear more than Trump is a wealth tax. So that was never going to be allowed. So the fact that they got Biden is fine. Now they'll chuck money at Biden. If he wins, great. If Trump wins, he may be offensive. He may hurt African-Americans. He doesn't hurt them. Because if it wasn't for COVID, their stock portfolios would be up another 20%. So it, 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 the Democrats find themselves in a very unenviable place whereby the firepower they need to win elections doesn't support what their rank and file actually want. And what, one of your arguments is that actually, you know, the call for a wealth tax, which is often very popular on the more, you know, the radical section of, of the left, if you want to put it crudely, and although it's increasingly gone mainstream, you actually sort of seem to argue that, that that's problematic, that that isn't boxing clever. And politically, there are other avenues that need to be explored before we start shouting, let's raise tax and let's go after the wealthy. Can you unpack that a bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm less critical of net wealth taxes, if you want to use the technical term for it, uh, in the sense that basically huge amounts of income are derived from wealth, but are not declared as income. Now, what is declared as income is basically wages. And because corporates don't pay tax and because we don't have wealth taxes, the burden on ordinary workers is huge. And they don't, their wages aren't increasing at the same time they have a high tax burden. So simply turning around and saying, let's raise taxes on the rich. If you're talking about income taxes, there aren't enough of them. And it doesn't raise that much. Now, if you want to go with net wealth taxes, good luck. But that really means massive reforms of corporate taxation, right? Let's get a couple of facts on the table about this, just in case people aren't really aware of this. It's massive. There was a paper out from uh, CorpNet researchers in Denmark, I think it was CorpNet last year, that estimates that 40 45% of foreign direct investment flows around the world are companies dodging taxes by basically selling each other intellectual property rights that don't exist and then writing down the losses. Right? In 2010 and 2011, I personally paid more tax than General Electric. Yeah, seriously, right? So there's a huge issue there. But... There's also a huge global tax avoidance industry based around the tax havens, but actually really based around places like Ireland, based around places like the Netherlands. I love it when you get all this stuff about the frugal four, you know, complaining about the south of the EU, when in fact what happens is the Netherlands is vacuuming up about 10% of GDP through tax dodging, right? So the hypocrisy on this is absolutely huge. So what we suggest is basically more national and local solutions for actually building wealth for ordinary people. One of them is a national wealth fund. The other one that we want to talk about is digital taxation. We can go into that sort of stuff. But our basic message is you can't do much on income tax. You can do a lot about wealth taxes if you get really serious. But there's loads of low hanging fruit that we could do that would help us get ordinary people to build assets, feel more secure less precarious in their employment and have confidence in their society going forward. And just while we're at this point, um, before we go into some of your proposed solutions, you also talk a bit about the Eurozone. And obviously, this has not been um, a good crisis for the Eurozone. At least in my view, we've seen, you know, the, to put it crudely, the north-south divides really come back. And looking at some of the polling that we've seen in Italy, um, you know, you've seen between 35 and 40 percent of Italians saying, you know, they're now quite open to leaving the Eurozone mm -hmm. and or the European Union. And I was talking with Ashoka Modi um, in a previous conversation who's at Princeton. And Ashoka was arguing that actually long term keeping Italy within the Eurozone is, is essentially not viable, that the Italians mm -hmm. won't be able to invest in their own economy and also morally and ethically, it's probably the wrong thing to do. I mean, what's your sense on where this crisis and these this longer term problem that you point to in angry nomics leaves the Italians and the southern periphery. I mean, surely this is moral outrage too. Oh, it certainly is. And the big problem is this, that even if we factor out, we, let's say we don't blame the euro for the fact that they have a chronic competitiveness problem and a chronic uh, productivity problem. And Ashoka is quite right to say that that probably is the case, but let's leave, leave this aside. They haven't grown for 20 years. They went through an enormous shock because of the global financial crisis and then the austerity driven response, which f basically forces Italy to run a kind of budget surplus uh, over the cycle, uh, rather than being able to run a deficit which would cushion it in any way. 
So they've got the 11th or 17th biggest economy in the world. It's not big. And they have the third biggest bond market in the world. And it's about to blow out to almost Japanese proportions. The only thing that keeps this solvent is the fact that it's denominated in euros and therefore the ECB can continue to basically buy the bonds if it needs to or otherwise do some Jedi magic on the markets to make sure that they don't think Italy's insolvent when in fact it actually is, right? So there's a huge structural problem. Now you've got the German Constitutional Court coming along and saying, oh, you can't go around buying these bonds. Well, if you don't buy those bonds, what are you going to have to do? Well, interestingly, what the EU just magicked up this new Franco-German package of support, which is debt issued by the Commission, it's all very technical, is basically an end run around that problem. And it's all about keeping Italy inside. But the problem you identify is you can keep Italy inside, you can suppress the yields on their bonds, but what if they basically can't grow? What if at the end of the day, this is an economy that's just going to continue to shrink, continue to get older, and fundamentally be unable to pay the debts that it has accrued? Given that it doesn't have its own currency, it can't actually just basically pay the bondholders in the currency and say, stuff you take the losses. It's in the euro. So there's a big problem going forward. And the Germans are beginning to move, right? They're beginning to recognize this problem, but whether they're moving fast enough is an entirely different question. And just pivoting a little bit back to the UK before we get onto your broader proposals, one of the things that we've seen, you know, notably at the recent election was Boris Johnson and old it. Etonian um, Oxford graduate going into Labour's red wall seats and saying, I'll be the guy that will fix your areas. I'll be the guy that will address your moral outrage over a settlement that, that isn't working. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, the budget before this crisis, which feels a long time ago, talked about, uh, you know, infrastructure, you know, bridges, trains, you know, all of this stuff for Northern England and, and coastal towns. Uh, what's your view on that? I mean, are bridges and trains enough? I mean, what what do you do for those northern Labour heartland communities? And for Keir Starmer, how does he win them back? I mean, what's your prescription there? It's not easy. I mean, economists talk about what they call agglomeration effects, which is economists speak for something very simple, which is why they make it difficult. But essentially, people move to where cool people move. And talent goes where talent goes, and money follows cool people and talent, right? whether it's neighborhoods being gentrified or financial systems being built up, basically you want to be where the action is. And the action for the past 30 years has been in London. That's it. The rest of the country in terms of GDP growth doesn't really contribute. Scotland marginally, right? That's it. So everything else is a net transfer going out. That's an enormous problem. Now this is a global problem. This is what gives the, the, the Democrats the problem of having the, the flyover states, as they call them, versus the coastal hubs. If you think about the US figures, something like 85% of all venture capital money goes to four cities. But with private equity, it's even worse. The concentration is 100% in about five cities. So cities have become these growth hubs. Getting out there basically means you need things like industrial policy. You need regional policy. You need to break up your government and send them. It's not just longer the driver vehicle licensing center in Cardiff, right? You need to send the treasury to Manchester, right? You need to basically invest in your R&D and boost your scientific capacity. Oddly, I have to say this, this is precisely some of the thinking behind Brexit which is that simply being in a single market, let finance run around and hopefully we can trickle down to the rest of society, hasn't actually worked. And that Britain fundamentally needs to change its business model. Now there's a great deal of scepticism on the left about the fact that Boris is sincere about this. And I don't actually know because I don't live there nor do I know the man personally. But let's give him the benefit of the doubt in the following sense. If I told you six months ago that in response to a pandemic and an, and, uh, an economic crisis, the Tory government would do helicopter money and would pay 80% of wages almost indefinitely to keep people in employment. These are the people who 10 years ago, almost to the day, gave us the Osborne austerity budget, right? You would have said, Mark, you've been drinking. And that's exactly what's happened, right? So that tells me that we have come a long way. And it tells me that people, I think, across parties recognize that, if you will, the growth model of the UK as it's existed for the past 30 years isn't working and therefore it needs to change. Politics is about figuring out what that change looks like. And that brings us to your solution. So take the US and the UK as, as, as two examples. Um, you're proposing essentially a, a way for workers to have greater ownership over 
uh, the economy and ownership over assets through a national wealth fund. And also, intriguingly, uh, this idea of a data dividend that effectively citizens are paid for handing over their private data, which sort of becomes a substitute for a universal basic income in a way. I mean, just talk us through those two key proposals uh, in the book. And also, if you see anybody anywhere politically coming close to mm -hmm. doing them. Well, interestingly, on UBI, Spain has just introduced one. It was completely lost in all of the sort of the, the, the events of the past few weeks, but it is actually beginning to ha help happen. Um, I've been pretty critical of the notion of a broad UBI uh, for various reasons. I mean, let's take immigration, for example, right? Now, if let's say France pops in a UBI at 15,000 a year, if I'm in a country like Chad or Mali, and I can speak French, and I can get my hands on French papers, how many multiples of my current income is that? So you could create a real politicization of immigration beyond what we've got now, if you don't manage those types of programs well. Then there's the whole sort of uh, reaction on the right to this, which I think is you know totally natural. Isn't this money something for nothing? Shouldn't people work? It's not as if there's a shortage of work, right? So I've been somewhat critical of those things. I'm, I'm, I'm warming to them, but our alternatives to go with a few of them. Think about the data dividend. So 20% of the S&P, the stock market in the US, is driven by five companies. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, you know, the usual suspect, the fangs. And they're huge, their profits are enormous and they pay absolutely no taxes and we should be going after them for the taxes. But the more important point is this, we never think about this. We are their fuel, right? Every time you get on Facebook and put data in, that's what they're selling for advertisers. That's what they're weaponizing for election consultants, right? That's what they're selling in some cases to bail bondsmen to go track people, right? Through geolocation data from your phone. So everything that we do when we interact with these technologies is creating the wealth of those companies. All right, if this was a mobile phone technology, we would have a spectrum auction. And we would say, we're gonna give 25 years rights to occupy this part of the spectrum to these companies and does the minimum bid. And then we make some money off of it. Instead of which, we give it away for nothing. I don't see why we should do that. I think we should basically charge these companies for doing it. And if that makes them less profitable, fine, because they don't generate much employment anyway. And if that means that Granny has to pay a few quid for Facebook, I'm sure we could work something out. But at the end of the day, this is a huge bit of low-hanging fruit that could generate billions of pounds. And, and the National Wealth Fund, you point to places like Singapore as, as, as an example of that. I mean, how does that actually get introduced and implemented? Uh, I mean, is you know, how, for example, would governments in the UK or, or Europe go about actually implementing something like that? So we just missed a brilliant opportunity to do this. Setting these things isn't setting these things up is not complex. It's no more complex than the legal paperwork for a pension fund, right? And you can set that up basically in a week and a half if you want to, even even sooner. So the key notion here is this is actually not so much about an Elizabeth Warren type of proposal of getting workers on boards because that will hold management accountable. That's not the focus, nor is it backdoor nationalization. We envision this as a completely passive investment fund. Now, the model here is Abu Dhabi. So Abu Dhabi doesn't actually have that much oil, believe it or not. Uh, what did they do instead? They took the oil receipts that they did and they did a few other clever things and they became quite well off. And then they bought a quarter of a percent of everything. So they basically are kind of like an index of the entire global economy. Now, shares, equity, as it's more commonly known, tends to basically accrue about 6% a year interest, right? And growth, I should say, over time. So if you've got 6% compounded over time, that's real wealth in an economy that's growing at 1% or in the case of Italy, isn't growing at all. So why don't we all get the upside of the stock market? Because 80% of stocks are owned by basically the top 20% of people. How do we democratize this? Well, we just had a massive crisis. And in any crisis, investors dump stocks because they don't think that the income from the companies that justifies the valuations are going to be there because we're in a big recession or we expect one. So they get artificially depressed. What is it they want to buy? They want safety. So what is a safe asset? A government bond. So they go out and buy government bonds. So government bonds prices go up and the interest you pay in the bond goes down. They move inversely. This means, without using too much jargon, that the government's cost of capital, its cost of finance in itself, is inverse to the private sector in moments of crisis and goes negative in those moments of crisis. So what we could have done when the markets tanked 
rather than just allowing the Bank of England and the Fed to put a floor under prices and then let investors push them up with momentum, is we could have bought the lot. We could have issued 20% extra debt to GDP because we've just proven with this crisis you can do this and there's no inflation and no crisis. And then you could, after six to eight years, pay back all of that debt you used and then over another six to eight years generate somewhere in the order of 10% of GDP. Now imagine 15 years out that you played this smart and you got 6% 6 a year for 15 years. You've got negative real rates on your debt, so simply growing your economy eats away your debt. You don't need to worry about it. And there's no inflation. You could generate a huge amount of cash, like 30% of GDP. Imagine what you could do to reform British education. Imagine what you could do for the funding for healthcare workers. Imagine what you could do for people who wanted to start businesses by giving them venture capital for the public through a public VC fund. Right? What could we do if we had the UBI equivalent of the data dividend giving people a floor so that they can take risks, they could then borrow against this fund to be more entrepreneurial so that you could really give ordinary people the chance to start their own businesses. There's so much that we could do. Do you see anybody internationally who's coming close, obviously apart from a couple of the examples that you mentioned, do you see anybody within Europe or North America who, who's thinking about this and also with an eye on you know, we had a big discussion about Corbynomics here in the UK, who was basically talking about old school, you know, nationalization, yeah. workers on company boards, all that kind of stuff. But when you look at, say, Bidenomics, do you see any economic proposals that come close to some of these ideas and some of these uh, perhaps more unorthodox ways of dealing with this, you know, justifiable pressure on workers? So the United States ideologically is so split and politically so split, the the bipartisanship that you would need to get this in the United States, I just don't think is there just now. And I don't think Biden can force it. The idea that basically the state holds equity is just simply doesn't work. Um, instead of which we have a Fed which allows corporates to go out and borrow like their states and then dump the cost back on the taxpayer, which is what we're seeing. Um, I'm much more positive about Britain. I'm also positive about places like Germany trying this. And here's why. Let's think about Germany's business model. It's selling cars to the rest of the world. Now, China is already annoyed at them because of Huawei and a host of other things, and has threatened to stop buying their cars. Their bigger existential threat is electric. They're nowhere in this. All of the, making cars is a low profit, low margin business. All, all the, the, the value added is in software, believe it or not. So the Germans really need to get a leg up on this. That means they're going to have a lot of car manufacturer shares which are going to fall through the floor, which is going to hurt their ability to raise capital to compete with Tesla. Well, if the government started to take stakes, which historically the Germans have done, in these kind of falling technology companies, not with the aim of promoting, not, not like upper Clyde shipbuilders in the 70s of holding on to them for a few more years before they shut down, but so that you can essentially allow them the breathing space to get the working capital and tech that they need to make that shift into a green space, into an electric space, then you could use your sovereign wealth fund strategically in order to support the transition of companies into a green economy. So given that Europe seems to be very serious about this, this is one of the policy options that people are talking about, not very loudly, but uh, it could be one of the ways of helping companies manage that transition. Likewise with Britain, if you really want, Britain's got uh, really great resources in terms of data and tech, and uh, nanotech and all this sort of stuff. If you really want to invest in this, you're going to need more capital than you've got and you've already just got a ton of debt because of all the crisis that's going on and budgets may be constrained going forward. Well, if you were able to have a separate pool of capital that regardless of what your present budget looked like was growing at 6% a year, that'd be damn useful, right? So there's lots of reasons for, com for countries that aren't quite as polarized who want to think long term about investing in their economies and thinking about their economies again, not as like hubs in some kind of global, you know, network of wheel and spoke and big firms, but as national economies that serve a national purpose, that serve a national interest, which I think is the way that things are going, then that's a pretty smart way to do it. I mean, some of the discussion about this crisis, the end of globalization, you know, the end of international trade has been somewhat overblown, but I think yeah. you can certainly make the case that you know, if anything, this crisis on the other side, when we eventually come out, the nation state will be one of the big winners that we are going, I think, to have um, a much more robust conversation about how we can provide some national solutions to some of these 
uh, challenges and questions, and whether that's economically or, or whether that's politically. And, and putting personal politics to one side, I think that's just the reality of where we are, that you know, it was supranationalism that actually lost out quite quickly in this crisis. Mm -hmm. Whether you look at the European Union, whether you look at WHO in the US, whether you look at our new attitudes towards China as we come out of this crisis, I just think the public appetite for going back to this, you know, this, or continuing the status quo is not going to be there. So that kind of raises the question, Mark, I wanted to ask you about how does this crisis actually change the sort of economic zeitgeist, if you will, because from my perspective, I'm in political science, but it does seem to me as though economics has had a really difficult two decades. You know, it struggled ahead of the Great Recession and obviously um, received a lot of criticism for not um, adequately forecasting that. And then also many of my friends in economics, I think, have struggled to make sense of the political turbulence that's mm. followed the Great Recession and have viewed it primarily as being a byproduct of imports from China. And that's basically where the conversation has right. stopped. So, I mean, where, how, how do you view you know, this crisis in, in terms of its impact, both on the, the sort of the zeitgeist in terms of how we talk about economics, mm. but also economics as, as a discipline? Um, I mean, are, is it going to shake up both of those? Oh, we're going to have a whole conversation on this. All right, so I had a PhD student a couple of years ago called Odne Helgadotti, who now teaches at Copenhagen Business School, and she wrote this brilliant thesis on the, cha the changes in the math and macroeconomics that got us to where we are today. And the basic story, without getting super techie, is the following. Old Keynesian macro models that tried to predict the way the economy was going were kind of like Lego right you had a household and you had a firm and you had this and you bolted them all together and then you tweaked the variables and you tried to replicate the world as it was which is just a fool's errand and they got horribly complex and they give indistinct results and they fell out of favor along comes this thing called the representative agent the representative agent is the problem that you want something and i want something and loads of other people want something turns out mathematically it's really hard to sum all that together into a, a demand schedule right it kind of gets unstable right because what you want impacts what i want and you know it's, it's all much more interdependent now they had this kind of mathematical revolution within this called real business cycles where they basically said stuff it let's just pretend the economy is one person right and that person is ageless sexless tasteless and lives forever and then what we can do is we can throw shit at them in the form of interest rate hikes or economic crisis and we can model that and that basically is how we'll see the world. And that seemed to work well until 2008 when it utterly failed. Now, those types of models, so-called DSG models, still kind of rule the roost. The field itself is very, very technical and basically has invested a lot in those types of technologies. So just chucking them out and saying, we'll try something else, no academic field behaves that way. They evolve. They very slowly change their ways. Now, do we see more sort of recognition of what's going on? Absolutely. The whole notion of secular stagnation, right, which is basically Summer's prediction that there's no kind of equilibrium interest rate that brings supply and demand back in so we get to a higher level of full employment because of depressed investment. The whole focus on inequality, not just from Piketty, but from mainstream economists uh, as well, uh, Raj Sherry at Harvard and others. Uh, there's a whole slew of work which is really speaking directly to issues of trade and, you know, globalization. David Otter and his colleagues at MIT. So I think that sort of w there's, there's re long term structural reasons for why things don't change quickly. Right. And that's still there. But the on the ground work that economists are doing, I think they're very much uh, able to anticipate. What's the, way, what's the way to say this? They're in the same game as us. They're just using different tools. And they're still, they're, they get what's going on. One thing that's very interesting is they're starting to look at labor again. There's a broad recognition now that labor, guess what, isn't just a cost of production, but that having things like unions is the only mechanism by which workers actually get to claim their share of productivity gains. So if you abolish unions, that's it. I was going to ask you about that because I've just been reading a, another recent book, um, Michael Lynn's book, The New Class War, in which uh, Michael argues that what we need to do in some way is try and return to what he calls the, the the first great compromise where we had strong unions and we had a political class, however much, you know, we might not like that term that was, that was reasonably interested in actually, um, you know, uh, redistribution and trying to give workers a fair share 
uh, in the economy. And then, you know, I think consistent with your analysis from the 70s onwards, we basically just lost that completely. Um, I mean, how how do you get this bargaining power, this voice for workers back into the room? Um, because every time I look at an attempt to do that, um, you know, whether it's Britain's Labour Party, um, you know, whether it's reflected in the rise of sort of cultural populism, you know, cultural populists don't really have much of an interest in in bargaining power and unions. Um, how 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 can they get back into the discussion? You're right. It's very difficult. I mean, you have a much more heterogeneous workforce. All right. You've got people doing lots of different stuff. You have the rise of the gig economy. You have short term contracts, zero hour contracts. Organizing all those people along some kind of sense of common purpose was much easier when you had 10,000 white blokes who worked in a factory. And then you had 100 white blokes that led them. And then you had 10 people that sat down with management and they thrashed out a deal. Right? That, that's just not the world that we live in anymore. So if unions are going to be the solution, it has to be a very different type of union. Now, that doesn't say it can't be done. Um, even the, the, some of the most technologically advanced and highly skilled economies in the world are, of course, up in Scandinavia. They tend to survive financial crises really well. They tend to even do pandemics quite well, particularly if you're looking at Denmark and even Sweden's experiment in comparison to some other company, countries. These are high social trust countries whereby people actually do believe that the government is trying to act as an honest broker between different factions. If you have that, then you can organize, you can bring people to the table, you can give them new modes of representation. When the factories, big factories, the big Volvo factories disappear, bargaining continues, but it goes down to lower levels. And then you have matching agreements across the economy. So you can do this, but you need to have government that is committed to it. You need to have unions that want to work towards it. And most importantly, you need to have employers that actually think it's in their interest to do so. And part of the problem with the UK in particular is that the great financialization of the, U of the UK economy over the past 30 years has created a world in which th most incomes that matter, I mean, politically and, and in terms of investment, are derived from assets. They're not derived from wages, right? So if you care about asset markets, if you care about the city of London, if your metric like Trump is, despite all his rhetoric, is the stock market, when most Americans have nothing to do with the stock market, right? Then there's a disconnect. And we see that disconnect now, whereby in the United States, you've got, if you take the broad measure of unemployment, with U6, we've already got around 23% of unemployed. Uh, let's say you've got this terrible collapse in economic activity, but the stock market's booming, right? So that, well, yeah, but it'll, the Fed will do some more magic Jedi mind tricks and buy some stuff and it'll be back up uh, because it's become utterly disconnected. So my point being that if business basically is deriving its income from those types of plays, they don't have to care about workers, unions or anything else. And that's the disconnect that I find very troubling. And so looking ahead, I mean, just, you know, as we come sort of toward conclusion, looking ahead at, say, the US presidential election and just the future of the United States, I think one thing that many observers here in, in you know, the UK and Europe have, have found quite, quite um, disturbing is the extent to which this crisis has really exposed the weakness of the social fabric in the United States. And, you know, we always knew it was there, um, mm -hmm. but it's become much more visible. And, and not only in terms of the protests that have followed George um, Floyd's um, uh, murder, um, but 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 in general, um, you know the sort of you know the food banks, the queues, the, the fabric un unraveling. I mean, just sort of, what's your what's your best guesstimate here on on where the United States is going economically? Which is a massive question, but but are we going to be able to see this country somehow repairing its social fabric, or are you instinctively actually just pessimistic that angry nomics is is essentially the new norm now for the US and for the rest of our lives, it's just going to struggle to try and contain that. Uh, I would say that angrynomics is what we make of it. The, the, you know, to, to quote that old line from Terminator 2, the future is not set. I think that was the line. Anyway, um, no, I, I, I'm, it's not that I'm hopeful. I think it can play out in multiple ways. And it's not a question of Trump bad, Biden good or any of this stuff. These things run incredibly deeply, right? You cannot understand the political economy of the United States without reference to race. This isn't just people who are causing trouble for the sake of it. There was a boss, I'll give you one statistic which I found out last week, I, I tweeted out, which just blew me away. 
So there's a new Boston Federal Reserve Bank study on net financial household wealth in Boston, right? So when you take the assets and the liabilities, the value of the property, your credit card debt, your car loan, whole, you net it out, what does it look like? Your average white family is $247,000 in the plus. Your average black family in Boston has $8. Right, now just start there and you understand the massive disparities and how people talking about how we change language towards each other just isn't enough. And what's happened in this moment is that I don't think this one goes back in the ball. I think this is the rise of the second great wave of civil rights claims in the United States because this has been going on for too long. And this is not about police brutality, that's a symptom, but it's the underlying marginalization of millions of black Americans, right? At the same time as those types of anger-inducing economic changes have happened to all Americans. Now, if you're smart about this, and then you think things like, maybe we should build wealth for ordinary Americans, maybe we should possibly stop bailing out Wall Street and make them actually take some losses, because let's face it, if they fail, it doesn't do anything in the real economy anyway. We've figured this out now, right? If we're actually able to find leadership that does that, you can head this country very quickly in a very positive direction. But if you continue to basically say, no, no, what we care about is Wall Street and we're going to pretend we give a damn about Main Street, then it will continue to get angrier. And if that Main Street is divided amongst different classes, different ethnicities, and above all in a black-white hinge in urban centres, as the economy craters, those people who already have very little have very, very little to lose. And if I could just push you, just, just lastly, Mark, I mean, this is more, perhaps more in the provocative direction, but certainly other writers have argued that there is a view or a, a belief system on the left that has really distracted many of its activists from class solidarity, from economic solidarity among workers, and that one of the problems with identity politics, if you want to call it that, left modernism, wokeism, lots of different terms, we know sort of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. that one of the problems is, is that you have a very um, strong preoccupation with um, gender and race, but class is kind of written out of the debate. And so, you know, uh, you know, particularly Democrat activists, labor activists are no longer really talking about class solidarity and economic redistribution, but are now sort of, de you know, taken away to look at these other yeah, yeah. entirely legitimate grievances. But do you think there's a, do, you, do you give that any credence? Do you think it's too simplistic? Do you think that in a way, you know, part of this is a supply side problem in terms of the left mm -hmm. and the messages that it's that it's pushing out or, or do you think that this is just something that has to happen at this particular time and class solidarity economic um, grievances have to sit in the back seat while we talk about these cultural questions i think it's more complex than that in the following sense blacks were never part of the class discussion right the new deal was basically a racist settlement you allowed the South an opt-out for agricultural labour and domestic labour, which essentially morphed into Jim Crow and didn't even begin to be addressed until civil rights in 65. Then you have the Great Migration North, with uh, blacks leaving in the 1940s towards factories in the North for rearmament. And then when you start to get deindustrialization a generation later, plus white flight and the freak out over security and the police that Nixon starts with the Southern strategy, you've got a group of people who have never really been a legitimate part of the class settlement. So the language of class to them has always rung hollow. What we've got to now is a situation, and there's a wonderful book on this uh, called White Fragility that talks about this, that really isn't, it, it makes the following point. It's not about, you know, having the right speech or talking about this or recognizing this or cisgendering this or whatever. It's basically the recognition that deep down inside, white people know that this settlement is grotesquely unfair towards blacks. And when you point that out to them, they get incredibly defensive. Right, and what we've seen with the right, what we've seen with the the um, the, the um, disturbances just now, the protests just now, is a recognition that that's really true, and we're going to push this, and we're going to keep pushing this to basically we start to see white people recognizing this and get on our side. And if you look at the opinion polling, it seems to be working, because you've now got a majority that supports Black Lives Matter. That's the first time that's happened. And also in terms of the left's internal politics, let's think about Bernie's campaign. There was this idea of the Bernie bro, right? Some guy who's a 30 year old lefty, might be an ex-military veteran, he's read a lot of Marx, blah, blah, blah. Turns out when you look at the people who actually studied the campaign, it's complete nonsense. 
the uh, biggest surprise was that uh, in certain states, the majority of Bernie supporters were Latinas. Right? So there was actually incredible diversity in that coalition. And that's a coalition that talked explicitly about class. So if you, so, had, to, yeah. so if you had to put all of that together, package it up and give us a forecast for November, what would you, what would you say? Well, if it had been any other, if it had been any other politician than Trump, you would say he's already dead. But he is, as the BBC noted today, a very instinctual politician. And what he's doing is he's going back to his base, but he's playing the Nixon strategy. I am your law and order president, right? The fact that this weekend he's going to Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is the home of the Tulsa race riots, where over 100 African Americans were slaughtered in a race riot to give a rally. I mean, it's a pretty clear dog whistle signal, right? It's like in the dog whistle. That's literally letting the dogs out, right? So he's saying, I'm playing this white strategy and that's going to be my strategy. Now, historically, that has worked. The key question is, has the American electorate changed? Are those polls to be believed? Now, my key thing here is what two things. Number one, what happens with the COVID recovery? Do we need to do shutdowns again? And if we do, that's going to create a lot of problems for Trump claiming anything about the economy. But the other one is, this is very different from the race riots of the 1960s because Watts is no longer the battleground, right? Because South Chicago is no longer where we care about. A lot of the gentrified neighborhoods that are now filled with young white wealth are but historically black neighborhoods. And in fact, many of those neighborhoods think Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, right? Which was where Spike Lee started do, uh, doing his first films are now like gentrified neighborhoods. Well, if those, riot, if those uh, protests turn into riots and Trump is able to weaponize that, exactly in the way that we talk about politicians weaponizing agronomics, then those numbers could start to change. Did so look at, yeah, I did look at yeah. a polling yesterday and I, I and also Obama made this point that, you know, this isn't like 1968 when you have 65, 70 percent of people saying the protesters have a valid uh, and legitimate grievance. Um, but what I also saw in the polling were some of the more radical proposals that are being um, discuss defunding the police being being one example. Uh, that's like the dumbest slogan ever, right? I mean, just stop saying it. It's not defund the police. What it is is we have cut because of the way taxes are raised in the United States. Federal, uh, state, and local budgets have shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk because basically we've given tax cut after tax cut after tax cut. As a consequence, things like mental health have basically shut down. So you end up with homeless, mad people on the street, right? Forgive me for saying mad, and that's probably not right these days, right? But you've got homeless, mentally ill people on the street. Whose lap does that fall into? The cops. Do you think the cops want to be doing this? No. Number two, we've got a program where the Pentagon, right, the army, gives their unused and surplus equipment to the cops. That's why they have tanks. Why do cops have tanks? Why do they need a budget to maintain tanks? They shouldn't have tanks, right? So defund the police is, how about we give the police money to be police and stop expecting it to be somewhere between a military command unit invading with, protecting us from a foreign army and social workers because they're crap at both. But, I, but I'd also say that, yeah, I mean, you know, readjusting budgets might be one issue, but that's not, currently that's not how it's being communicated. So... You know, many Americans will be going on social media and just reading defund the police and totally. looking at some of the YouGov, some of the YouGov polling. You know, you've got 16, one six percent of Americans saying that they would support that. The vast majority saying they wouldn't. And clearly, I think Trump's strategy, as you say, is to try and tap into that sense that you, know, you have a Democrat Party that is now talking about removing police officers. And however um, exaggerated and you know rather over the top some of those claims will be and you and I can sit here and say you know that's the case in many of the flyover states and rust belt states and swing yeah. states as we know that will be taken very differently and I wonder you know, what's been remarkable over the last few days is, is the speed at which Biden has disassociated himself yes. from some elements of that well it's a, it's a dumb claim I mean it's, a, it's simply a dumb term right the problem is let's reapportion the budget for sensible for Munich policing is not actually a catchy slogan, right? When you're shouting it in the middle of a protest. So he will distance himself from that. The question is, will he deliver? I mean, let's go back to that number that I quoted you. Eight bucks versus $247,000. If he's actually going to do something about that, then he's going to make a difference. And then in a sense, the protests will have achieved the goal.
If all the protests do is bring people who are violent people with badges to justice because they murder people, then that's something, but it hasn't changed anything structurally. And that would be the big disappointment. Well, Mark, listen, thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, talking about the book, Angronomics. I've got it here. Um, uh, obviously recommend it to everybody. It's a brilliant read. And as you say, you've, you've really sidestepped all of the jargon that... Uh, that dominates the academic stuff and and you know it is written more as a conversation uh or, or in a series of dialogues than it is in a sort of traditional economics book so um you know i wish you success with the book thanks for joining the conversation and thanks everybody for uh, also tuning in yeah thanks it's been great cheers